everybody. Good afternoon, at least here at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. My name is Mark Schellhammer. I'm the MC and moderator for today's event. I direct the Human Space Flight Lab here at Johns Hopkins University and also a program that we call Bioastronautics at Hopkins that aims to promote human space flight not only here at the university, but at other universities and institutions as well around the country and around the world. This is part of a larger umbrella group at Hopkins called Space at Hopkins. Our efforts in the bio, bioastronautics initiative specifically are supported by the Commercial and Government Programs Office of the Office of the Dean of Engineering at the university. And today's event is actually run by our partners, Hopkins at Home, which provides the video and online promotion and production. In February, we held our first public event at, uh, for bioastronautics at Hopkins. That was a virtual half-day symposium covering a wide range of human spaceflight research topics. Many of those topics are posted online. Today is the first of a series of mini symposia where we focus on a specific topic of an introductory presentation, comments from some panel members, two in this case, and then audience participation. Participation will be in the form of written questions that you can submit online during the presentations to be read to the panel by my assistant, assistants, Nabila Ali and Ben Johnson, assisted by Dorothy Coker and also Linda McLean. If the situation calls for it later in the discussions, we may switch to a more interactive session where the audience can actually speak to the uh, verbally to the panel. Those of you who have registered formally for the event have received a Zoom link for that. We may or may not get to that. So the topic for today's discussion is systems medicine for spaceflight. We all recognize that there's a need for medical care in space and the more challenging the mission, the more challenging will be the medical requirements. But what do we mean by systems medicine? Well, it's not yet a well-defined uh, a well-defined term. I think of it in terms of both lateral and vertical integration. So lateral or horizontal integration being the interaction of the various physiological and psychological systems within a given person and vertically being the interaction of an individual with the other crew members among themselves with mission control, with the spacecraft and its systems and with the goals of the mission Spaceflight is a limited resource situation, and sometimes those limited resources include time and information. So clinical decision support becomes part of the medical system, especially if decisions have to be made about the level of care to provide based on available resources, expected outcomes, and mission needs. In my mind, those are all relevant parts of systems medicine. But you didn't come here to come here to hear from me, so allow me to introduce our esteemed, esteemed speakers for today. The keynote talk leading off is by Dr. Jennifer Fogarty, Director of Applied Health and Performance at Sofix Synergistics. She previously held several positions at NASA, including that of Chief, Chief Scientist for the Human Research Program, position that I held for a time, and also I believe one of the other Chief Scientists from the Human Research Program uh, may be joining us online today, and that's Dr. John Charles. So. Uh, if that is the case, then we have three of six, three out of the six, at least, of the Human Research Program Chief Scientists on board today. Other members of the panel include Dr. Eric Antonson, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine with a joint appointment in the Center for Space Medicine, previously Element Scientist for the Exploration Medical Capabilities Group at the Human Research Program at NASA, and Dr. Chris Leinhardt, who currently holds that position as chief scientist, essentially, for exploration medical capabilities. That group, by the way, is tasked with carrying out the research needed to ensure that the appropriate medical system is in place for future missions like the moon eventually to Mars. So you can see that we have certainly the appropriate people here to talk about this topic today. And with that in mind, I will turn it over to Dr. Fogarty to lead us off with a moderately brief presentation. Dr. Fogarty, break a leg. As always, thank you very much, Dr. Schallhammer, for that uh, 
very lively, informative, and eclectic introduction. Uh, I appreciate my other panel members here because I'm gonna I'm gonna put a bunch of stuff up on the wall for both the my panelists and for the audience. So we expect uh, some lively questions at the end and, and lots of issues to talk about. So yes, Jen Fogarty uh, spent about 17 years at Johnson Space Center working space medicine and ultimately the human research program. I was even a translational scientist at one point trying to help space medicine understand what the research program was doing and why it might be valuable. That <laughs> was not a trivial task on any given day. Uh, I left last year um, actually January, 2021, we're still in 21 pandemic years, um, to work in a human centered design firm. Um, and not that I left space flight, actually, I wanted a broader application in healthcare and, and medical technology, but it was really, um, you know, time to step away and, and look at how we do things, um, and how to apply them to a bigger ecosystem. So in space flight, that's kind of going to be our, our example case, and we're also going to talk about the bigger issue with systems medicine. As Mark said, you know, there's there's lots of different definitions going on. So um, come across some imagery recently that as I talk about things or think about things, it's it's quite like provocative or you know challenging. And of course, this isn't correct, um, but it is with the respect to intent. You know, we're here on Earth. We've been leaving Earth to explore space for 60 some odd years. Um, we haven't traveled very far yet, relatively speaking. Um, we're trying to get back to the moon with the Artemis program. And it, it really is a moon to Mars opportunity. And um, we have a lot to learn about sustaining that journey. But one of the things that when I look at this, it, it reminds me of, because I, I give lots of talks even about the spin back to Earth, the value back to Earth. And I truly have always believed that the efforts we put into human spaceflight because of the criticality and the um, austereness of what we're trying to achieve, you really strip things down to the barest level of requirements often, right? We, we were you know, almost not allowed to use the word optimization. That I always tell people that that's kind of a no-no. You go into a board meeting and if you're optimizing something, you've got too much time, money, and re any other resources you could think of. Like what what is, the bare minimum that you need to get through this together. What does the evidence support? And if you don't have evidence, you know, you've got a battle in front of you and you need to go find a platform to go get it. But it's also, when I think about medicine in the human body coming from a medical physiology, my training, it was about like conservation of energy. Like it's neither created nor destroyed. You know, it's moving between the systems. One is pushing, one is pulling. So anytime we're looking at a change in a system, and the human body being a system of systems, like who, what, what is responsible and why is it doing what it's doing? Because in order to really defend against it or to enable it, if it's appropriate, such as adaptation, like how do we make sure we don't make the wrong choice? And, and we're gonna get into a lot of um, the concept of the computer science aspect of algorithms and prediction. Um, and doing some math on biology. And it's a very exciting opportunity but how do we get confidence in what we're doing and to start to really trust that as a decision support tool? I would like to stay away from the idea that it's telling us what to do because we have a lot of expertise and uh, human components to how we apply that knowledge that's incredibly important. And I hope we don't ever underestimate the value of that. So again, talking about systems medicine and looking for definitions and how we express ourselves. So there's some really, good work out there, whether it be journal articles, journals dedicated to systems medicine, um, you know, books on it, chapters on it, you know, it's, it has some, some things that keep on coming up in terms of mechanistic models, processing data. It's really about getting down to the individual level. And we're going to talk about what we do now versus what this is in terms of a future state. Um, and predicting different outcomes so that you can run scenarios before you try it in real life. Um, also understand kind of the combination between treatments and other say non-pharmaceutical activities that might happen in an individual's life. Um, in space flight, we are acutely aware of the metadata and the effect of the environmental exposures. We spend a lot of time, we call them five hazards um, I don't really go through them in this talk. I'm sure you're very familiar with them. Uh, radiation, isolation, confinement, 
changes in gravity, altered gravity, um, hostile closed environment, because we provide the environmental control and life support system when we fly people, and then distance from Earth, because that's part of a mitigation strategy, but also one of the psychological contributors when you're that far away. You've not got a plan B on the, on the way to Mars. Um, and then looking at different outcomes, you know, when you have all that data and a credible way to analyze it, to start to determine the best risk benefit posture for any given person. Um, and it's actually on this European site where they talk about a case and it's for systems medicine. Uh, one of the, the major leaders in the area talks about him and, the, and a colleague who suffered the same exact cancer diagnosis. And he said, the difference is that he's standing there today giving the talk and his colleague has perished due to the disease state. And they received both the state of the art care. It only worked for one of them. The job of systems medicine is to know why. How could we have known why the other person was not going to be responsive to that treatment? And what should we have done differently? What about them made them not responsive to it or their cancer? not responsive to it. So again, the targeted therapy. Um, it's also, I'm gonna get a little deeper into pharmacogenomics because it's so tangible. There's a, a standard of care around it, a clinical practice guideline that for the drugs that use a particular enzyme, it really can be used to minimize risk while optimizing efficacy and take some of the mystery out of whether someone's responding or not because of the complex factors that go into treating someone who may be physiologically not capable of responding or have comorbidities that add a level of complexity that's not very transparent at the time the diagnosis and treatment are going on. So it's really considered um, a path to being personalized. And actually I, I would not disagree and I'm sure as medical providers that you do personalize today to the best of your ability, but it can be very, um, on the back of the individual clinician or the clinician and their staff to try to personalize it. It can be constrained by their knowledge of the evidence base. It's not necessarily very robust in terms of, you know, hundreds of thousands of physicians contributing millions of patient data entries in order to figure out, well, if you were to run those scenarios, does your experience base really reflect the broadest evidence base of all of the options. And that's what I think needs a little bit further discussion about how we get there. We do a lot of collection and different data collection in different manners, but how do we get to a place where we're actually using it productively? And I get there will be issues with privacy and security um, and some other things we have to protect for that we'll talk, talk upon. And I was thinking when Dr. Shellhammer mentioned lateral, you can go at many different levels from a macro level all the way vertical from a policy perspective. What is the nation's policy? What is legally what is allowed and, and facilitated or incentivized to occur so that we can approach system medicine all the way down to the individual clinician practitioner and, and what is their approach? Um, and then laterally, it would be physician to physician, but then in the body, there's that same hierarchy. You got vertical integration as well as uh, horizontal integration. So that kind of cycle repeats itself at different levels. So you have macro and micro cycles and how do they influence each other? How does the data move? Um, and how do the outcomes when you actually have, have action and then you see consequence, how does that fold back into the cycle? So when we talk about medical evidence base, um, you know, constantly growing, right? Research, journal articles, uh, I'm now an associate editor and uh, quite swamped with the number of articles coming out. <laughs> and I'm sure every journal and every editor is in the same case. And, and it's an amazing accomplishment, but it can be overwhelming and, and really unwieldy. Like, how do you turn this information into knowledge? Um, I may be um, fortunate enough to read a lot of those things, but at some point I, I'm at my limitation or even the application of the knowledge. That's not necessarily, you know, the best use of, of the article is for me to read it. it it's meant for someone else. Some, you have to get it out there um, and find that individual in crowdsourcing to take a little bit of a tangent. I used to call it, instead of finding the needle in the haystack, you treat it like a magnet. You put your hand up and you ask the question and the needle comes to you. You know, and the resources that can happen um, 
with databases and deep knowledge capabilities that could allow you as someone asking the question or seeking the insights, you could have the, the needle brought to you like a magnet rather than having to sift through searches and papers and, and deal with good peer review or not or repeatability or not. Somewhere where that vetting is occurring in terms of evidence base. And again, going back to trust in it um, and trust in the process and then trust in the product. Uh, lots of principles for system engineering, computer science, and even failure analysis are embedded in the concept of systems medicine. So it keeps reiterating a multidisciplinary approach, not just in the medical evidence base, but then in the other principles about organizing data, relating data, uh, and vetting the data. Um, broad and deep analysis. So you're going to have large scale population information but again, going back to the idea of individualized, it has to go very, very deep on that individual. You can't just know what their blood pressure and heart rate were and body temperature that day, but what are their environmental exposures? What are their lifestyle factors? What are their comorbidities? What about their family history? And of course, genetics and genomics are gonna play a role in this to go even deeper on any given individual. So we all know that it's going to wind up into being very incredibly large data sets, but it's gonna be necessary as you know, part of the, what feeds the engine to turn out the other side, which are the outcomes to allow us to predict and then understand the reliability of the predictions. How often were you right? Um, and what was it informed by? And how do you continue to refine that cycle? So going back to the vertical on the largest macro scale, it's really a layered approach. Policy. Um, the intent is to be inclusive, right? We know there are often disparities and uh, social determinants that make the outcomes very different for people who may on the surface seem like they should have had similar outcomes. So how do they play a role? How, how do those factors weigh in there? That if we intend to be inclusive, we have to allow proper resources to be allocated to be truly inclusive. Um, and that is often, and, and NASA is not, um, it is very susceptible to that at times. It wants confidence and answers, but it has trouble sometimes being able to allocate, you know, frankly, dollars to areas to get that because other priorities move up the chain, such as building the rocket. If you can't go and you can't send people, why are you sending people to go a place you can't go? So we get kind of in this vicious cycle and it's like, well, then I don't have the evidence for why the people should be able to go to Mars if I haven't done the research and in a timely enough manner to go with the rocket building. So there, there has to be a coordinated effort here when you have this type of intent. That's why policy leadership, um, both at the national and global level have to align themselves to really incentivize and foster a process that gets us there. The other aspect is harmonization across disciplines. And, and this could be taken a lot of different ways. So it, this is my terminology. You know, when I think about not forcing everyone to do the, the data collection the same way, but having to know, and this comes from like the concept of operations, how are you expected to contribute to the whole? How is your data meant to be integrated in so that it's meaningful? Now it could, there's a lot of agility there in terms of what's delivered to the patient at the time a technology is used, what's delivered to the, the caretaker at the time the technology is used versus how the data is ported over to the database to be analyzed later could be slightly different but you'd have to know that prospectively and have a plan for that. So data management, data distribution, all really have to be considered. Um, and I think that could be part of something like an FDA regulatory responsibility. You know, having that as part of a medical technology, if that is a priority of the nation for us to get there and improve healthcare and also reduce costs, keeps coming up over and over again as theories, but I'm not an economist, so I don't have the numbers for you today, but Logically, you can see why it could go there. Uh, also for the user, neutral or reduced workload during application. And we have two active physicians who are on the panel. Um, I happened to spend some time in a hospital last week. And anytime I've ever worked with uh, physicians or caregivers, nurses, it, the, you know, the workload is challenging and to stop and do more work to facilitate a future value may not happen, right? If you, if you are adding work, even though you can make the case that it's added value later, but it's not added value today, it's not gonna make the list. It, it may not happen. Um, 
you have to come in and make sure you're at a threshold where it is doable. Or even we, we talk about um, in spaceflight with crew members that they don't even need to know what's happening. Could it be done in the background? Could it be a byproduct of something they already have to do? That's added value. So kind of keeping these things in mind about how you might instrument the capability within the healthcare paradigm. I think also the concept of system medicine, you know, and, and starting in the site, it's a cyclic thing. So you have to start somewhere in the cycle. Currently your thinking or your application says, well, we're dependent on the technology of today or the near future, but we could also be influential to the technology. If you could just tweak it that way, it would be so much better. How do we get the ability to articulate those other requirements when we align to what the intent is to achieve a systems medicine approach. And then it really requires evidence-based enabling action. And what I mean by this is you're gonna align the research, not just finding the biomarker that tells you something, syndrome X is going to happen within five years, or you know this sort of pathological state will appear in three to six months. But what do you do about it? And it's not only, it's not always at the, at, <laughs> you're not always acting on the biomarker, right? The biomarker is a surrogate for something, but how do you partner that with action? Because that's where the true value lies. Not only do you know it might happen, but you have something to do about it. Um, we can talk a little bit about even in spaceflight, gaining knowledge and insight into an impending issue or the fear of an impending issue because you're seeing change you can't interpret in a healthy person can become dangerous at times. Um, and that has always been the tension when you're doing something like flight certification and readiness and could even be more dis disconcerting if you're getting the data on a mission, the crew member <laughs> and the medical care who's, who might be you know, out of sync from a communication standpoint, they can't return in the case of the Mars mission. And now you're just in a wait and watch and I don't know what to do. We don't wanna set anybody up for that scenario. So that's why you gotta pre-plan and understand the coordinated effort of the knowledge I gain, I actually have an alignment of an action. So there's always research um, parallel path to the identification, the use of a technology and say the identification of a biomarker. So the path from precision medicine to personalized. So precision medicine is an enabler. And this really, again, is another term when you look it up and you say, well, what does it mean? And, and it really depends on who you ask. I mean, there's, there's, again, lots of great minds out there ever since, you know, even before the Human Genome Project, which just had its 20th anniversary in, in 2020, you know, astounding accomplishments with, you know, what we can sequence and um, the things we can identify. The key is knowing what it's happening. What does it mean, you know? Um, and that when you think about precision medicine or read about it, the consensus comes out, it's really the application of medicine based on individual biology, which makes sense, <laughs> but more specifically their genetic makeup. And now you're getting into a realm of measuring something, but do we know what it means? Um, and I looked at uh, the government agencies, a lot, a lot of academic institutions, and they, and they all align. Um, but again, the discussion is, it's not like you're trying to replace medicine of today. You're trying to refine it and evolve it. So they're uh, coming up in a, in a couple of slides. There's a really good example of a definition that I just flat out quote, because I couldn't, couldn't paraphrase it. But, it. but it gets at the point that it's much more comprehensive than one or the other. It's both, but both have to change as we go. And again, that's about that intent of the larger goal we're all trying to achieve. There's always a growing evidence base. And, and I wrote this bullet about the genome-wide association studies, the GWAS, because they're so proliferative. And it has a lot to do with all of that sequencing data um, being generated and put it into database. And many people can go in then and do statistical analysis and, and run different cap um, analytic capabilities on that data and churn out correlations. Um, the paper I quote here is excellent because it's, it is so informative about being smart about how you interpret what you see in these papers and the different methods that are used. And it's not critical in any way, but it is um, critical thinking. So it's very constructive in helping people understand what can I understand from this study and what are the caveats? What are the uncertainties? You see a lot of headlines. Um, a lot is put out in the popular media and, and I am a proponent of, being skeptical 
I said I was probably genetically born skeptical, and then that's why I was predisposed to become a scientist. And man, you just sharpen that point over and over again. So a lot of fun at dinner parties where this panel's going to be a good time with my panelists because it's a, it's a right and okay to be skeptical. Like, let's poke at it, you know, let's, let's figure out, let's understand where we are today. Where are you taking me? What evidence do you got? How, you know, how do we qualify it and quantify it and grade it? Um, and, and also understand about the repeatability. And, and research deserves its time to be ugly, you know, go do your thing. But when you're gonna move it into um, the application domain, that's when it's gotta read a threshold, reach a threshold and be a consensus product that we believe now amounts to evidence that's actionable. That's the next part when we talk about, you know, how many genes, and, and I got a little grief on my last talk about this, which was fine, because I, I am not an expert in genomics by any stretch of imagination. But honestly, 73 genes are, are identified as truly actionable. And that's not to dismiss the others, just, and I use the phrase that they were, you know, can modulate outcomes or be related and correlated. But, you know, it, there are other genes out there that, other than these 73, that have much higher uh, rates of relationships that, you know, causality-ish, you know, but there, there are these unknown factors because there's still a large percent of the population who have those genes who do not manifest a pathology. So what are the other genes that modulate them? What protects them? Was it another gene or the lack of an environmental exposure or an environmental exposure? There are a lot of complexity. And so when you talk about 73 genes, that means there's 19,927 genes, if we cap it at 20,000, who are not directly actionable. It's gonna take a lot more work. And this is a perspective thing. So again, no disrespect. And I know other people can talk about this much more thoroughly than me, but again, I just keep it in front of folks. Like, let's be careful about where we are today. It's not that we don't wanna get someplace else, but a little skepticism creeps in and, and just trying to be careful. Spent a lot of years having to sit at board meetings and triangulate against some pretty constrained resources and articulate um, the needs of the crew members, the requirements and the mission very carefully so that we could support what we were trying to achieve. So here's the example with pharmacogenomics. And this is actually a paper about space flight that was done on the ISS medical kit. And they mapped the drugs that were in the kit against um, the cytochrome P450 isoforms. And they talked about the breakdown. And the reality is this is a fundamental piece of information that can be really informative to baseline your risk. You don't have to guess. There's no wrong answer here, by the way, in terms of genes. There, there's no bad, <laughs> there's no bad isoform. It's a matter of understanding who will respond to what. And again, the drugs are using a certain isoform. This is mapped out under the FDA. And we talk about like, this is a very practical thing that can be very helpful to any patient on earth if it's available to you and you could request getting it. And it, you know there might be a payment issue, but in space flight, why wouldn't we do this for the small number that we send, whether it be commercial or government space flight? Right off the bat, and it's, it happens to align with a lot of drugs that are used, whether it be sleep medications, anti-nausea medications. This way, if you don't get a response you expected, at least you know the person was capable of metabolizing that drug or not. So just fundamentally, this paper set up like, it's kind of a no duh moment. This, this doesn't run a lot of risk for the individual. You're, there's no select out criteria here. It's not good or bad fundamental knowledge to manage risk and assure yourself a better outcome. So it gets us toward the concept of precision medicine, even in an extreme environment. But even if you were to align this with someone who was able to metabolize a medication in space flight, you have several other stressors, you've got physiological adaptation happening. So it's not just your genes. You, you, can't, you can start there in terms of, okay, let's understand our baseline. But now you got to understand this complex environment. And while in space flight, we talk about things like radiation, you know, isolation and confinement, we got high CO2, um, temperature management, um, even more body temperature management, um, the, the fluid volume shifting to the upper body and the change of the vascular responses. We've got stuff going on neurologically, optically, ophthalmically, um, you know, so on earth, 
people have equally as dynamic lifestyles. They may not be extreme environments or maybe we're not aware of the extremeness in their environments because the data is not collected and they're not isolated per se in the concept, the same concept of a spaceflight mission. But in the spaceflight paradigm, we try to do research to say fundamentally what's changing in the physiology that then we also have to add into the calculation of how do these outcomes occur? What's the probability? Um, and what is the consequence? And if we understood the individual components to those calculations, we could be more precise with our risk management. Because it's not that we don't want to send anybody, everybody, but we also have to be honest in terms of when you're leaving this planet in a single rocket with three to five other people, depending on the mission size, sending someone who's destined for failure can take the whole crew out. And, and will definitely disable the mission, but, but could be catastrophic for many reasons because of the limited resources. And we also know, and, and Dr. Sean mentioned the psychological components in dealing with the fact of could a crew let a crew member, could a crew let a crew member die so that all the resources were not used up and they could return. In the case of the Mars scenario, because there's no return, there's no resupply capability. The package can't catch you. Right, the best you could do if they launched it, maybe retrieve it on the way back. You've seen some of this in movies. I'm not sure how realistic it is with orbital mechanics, but if you pre-deployed something, but then it's aging as well. The idea is what you leave with is what you've got. And if you had one crew member who was gonna use up a significant amount of your medical resources, that means your mission cannot tolerate another situation occurring with a different crew member or that crew member again. So. There's a lot of analysis that goes into understanding what is the risk posture would take if you knew something about an individual and their vulnerabilities. And it's not that they shouldn't go to space, but maybe not that mission. So if you're lucky enough to have different mission durations and locations, you can stratify risk posture differently. But this is an inherently important concept to managing risk in austere and extreme environments. Precision is important but it's not the only thing you need to pay attention to. So back up, what do we do today? So I mentioned this before, experience base. And in an earlier talk, and Dr. Schellheimer has heard this quote from me before, it's like, as amazing as any one of us are with you know our education and our experience base and how we've dedicated ourselves to the disciplines of choice, our experience base actually does not constitute an evidence base. Like we have to be humble enough to admit that and try to learn from others. The challenge is how do we get knowledge from the others to us, right? We gotta be willing to put our knowledge somewhere. It needs to be aggregated. It needs to be run through algorithms. We need some help from computer science and math. And then how do we turn it back out so that it's utilized, so it's utilitarian. How do we use that as a component of evidence base? So experience base can contribute to evidence base just iteratively um, and hopefully seamlessly and unobtrusively. Going back to my comment, if it's added work to people who are already in critical fields and very busy with what they do and patient care is the priority, it won't happen. We gotta be smart about how we help them deliver their experience base to the evidence base. So we do a lot with epidemiology, right? Big population studies go in. And one of the best quotes from that European Association of System Medicine is, and I say this all the time, even in spaceflight, it was like, no one's the average. I worked on data with the biomedical data reduction group forever. And you were like, we would do all the math and the dots when we did the distribution of the people, very rarely was a dot on that average line. So the average is bogus. Right, it's helpful, right, mathematically and creating curves and, and plots. But the reality is that's not representing anyone. So you really struggle with saying, I'm gonna use that to go generate a requirement to build a system if it represents no one. You gotta respect the large degree of variability that's happening in the human population, going back to diversity and inclusion. It's uncomfortable and it makes it harder, but it's necessary. So really what's the approach? And I'm gonna do this very briefly because I got two physicians on the panel, so I'm gonna let them talk to it. Start with the phenotype. You get your physical exam, your clinical testing. You're gonna start getting data on the person you're dealing with, who most likely is coming in already sick, right? They wouldn't be coming to you if they didn't have a problem. 
which is key because you don't have what they looked like before. Because this is what I find so interesting about building the system and being proactive, even with the person. Getting their baseline as early as possible, true preventive medicine and characterizing them when they're well is key to understand how they go the other way and when they might go the other way. Um, you compare those phenotypes to populations. Is this normal? Clinical thresholds, upper limit, lower limit of normal, like different body systems, um, even molecular work, you know. So you assess the similarity and dissimilarity to population thresholds and you have red flags thrown at you and you have to, you know, dispose of the issues and do your differentials. Like, does this one matter? Is this one off, but okay? Or it, you might have the last time they were at the ER at their primary care position. You're like, well, that's always been kind of wacky. And that, that's a, like personal terminology I've gotten recently. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, again, none of us are average. So maybe we run high or maybe we run low. So rate of change matters. I hear that a lot too. Like there's some disorders where it's starting to really come through that just having an abnormal value is not what you're looking at, but a rate of change for an individual is the flag, at least to go looking more deeply. So then of course you have clinical practice guidelines and they at least form a standard of care. And this is also where things can be a slippery slope that they're meant to address the average, most likely the population, the epidemiology driven information. It is not wrong. It kind of gets you on the ball field, but exactly where you are, that, that's the individual doctor's job and it can be very manual at times. Um, and then of course, patient care is refined and revised over time. How, even on the order of minutes and hours and days and weeks and months, how are they responding appropriately or not appropriately? <laughs> you know, do we have to change course here? Those decisions are made real time and reiterated. Um, and obviously there's a team approach to it. And then surveillance, new evidence is taken in, new insights and informs a new approach. And then you go back to the top. So there is a cyclic nature to it, um, but could we give people a better start? Could we understand what someone's genomic baseline means to them, where their vulnerabilities are, things to look at over here to the right rather than to the left? So it can kind of help us um, be more sensitive and specific at times if, if we knew what those things were, were leading the person toward, if, it, if we could get the evidence to support that. And again, the the reiteration of that through seeing that the predictions actually come true or not. So here is the comment um, I was referring to before. And this comes from um, Jeffrey Ginsburg and a colleague at the Center for Applied Genomics and Precision Medicine at Duke, which I found really, really helpful, just because of the comprehensive nature of the statement, that the goal of precision medicine in this case is to optimize disease prevention but is based on comprehensive information incorporating traditional clinical measures. So he's not throwing anything out. He's gonna to add to it. They're gonna to add to it. Um, clinical measures and data with DNA variation, gene expression, metabolites, methylation, uh, and or microbial composition. Now we're talking about not only the microbiome of the individual and how that might be disrupted, but their environment, um, which in space flight is very interesting because of the confinement um, and trying to understand the value of having a diverse and renewed microbiome that tends to happen here on earth when you get a lot of exposure versus one that is not going to be renewed. It could start out diverse, but the studies have shown us that everyone kind of then shares their microbiome and it becomes a very static population. And the idea of it being dynamic, just like in any aspect of being adaptable, that dynamicism facilitates the adaptation, right? Because you have a lot of variety of responses to be able to make when the stressor occurs, if you have that dynamic relationship. If it's more static, if you happen to align with the stressor, you're good. But when you're static and you don't align with the stressor and you can't mount a response, that's bad. You're just out of options. So the idea is to have a repertoire sitting in the background waiting to facilitate many different moves well, you know, it's like the best defense is a good offense. So if you lose that capability, you might be okay, but it's, you were lucky, you weren't good. So in space flight, I'm always worried with human health running out of luck because we are, there's a lot we don't understand going on in the background that positioned us for success. <laughs> and I'm not always so sure what space we're working in. All right, so moving on to something a little bit more tangible. Who's working on it? Tons of people 
tons of brilliant minds, tons of brilliant um, institutions, including Johns Hopkins, obviously, but this one came up and this is coming out of UCSF. And, and it graphically, it really hit on all the things we need to talk about. Um, you know, and when they go through this and it's beautifully done on their website, they do a video and then they talk about some examples, but it's about the people, whether it be the patient, the care team, including the physician, scientist, data scientist, physiologist, microbiologist, um, genomics researchers, but what role do we each play? And again, how do we coordinate relating that information? Where does it go and how does it become accessible and how does it become interpretable? And then how do we get to action? So a giant cyclic process where each one is contributing, but there's people ready to catch it. So it's a beautiful vision. I'm just never sure who's really doing what to make it happen, right? There's pieces of it happening. And again, going back to uh, consensus or harmonization, especially on the data management side, there seem to be some things emerging, at least at a given institution or multi-institution projects, you know, they've aligned and they, they understand how they're going to do their data acquisition and management, but globally it, it's very fractured. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see, like, can we get somewhere at least in one of the systems that seems to be a prototype for what could work and then scale it up. And again, I understand there's lots of concerns about privacy and protection of the data because we are worried about its misuse and manipulation, but you know, whether it's, you know, inform, if we start on the left side with basic molecular population science clinical discovery, that really constitutes the, the way our, our current evidence base coming out of hypothesis testing, going through full peer review, um, it's reflective of funding priorities, say at NIH, NSF, NASA even, and then moving into application in the real world with whether it be you know, digital health, you know, smart watches, something collecting ancillary data that we don't think of as medical per se, but it, it is definitely a potential contributor. And I know more people are agreeing to having that be used. It's just how does the medical record or the electronic health record accept it? What do I do with this? So you can give me all this great data about how many steps you take every day and, you know, what your activities are and whatever other metric, you know, sleep. Um, the, the sleep quantity, the sleep quality, you know, did it matter? Did it matter to you and where your body was taking you? Um, computing all of that stuff, the omics contribution, whether it be ordered by a physician or even people wanting their direct to consumer content put in uh, a health record um, and our confidence and maybe lack of insight into how those, those that data in those reports are really generated. And of course, there's lots of imaging going on. Um, which we use constantly, uh, even in spaceflight, to try to understand what's going on and, and trying to be proactive. Um, but again, it can be, it can be uh, a little challenging. It'll be okay. Um, it can be a little challenging in terms of seeing things that you didn't expect. In spaceflight, with the anatomy changing and in microgravity, sometimes you do find some unexpected things, and it is really hard to quantify how much that might be contributing to an outcome. But all that data has to go somewhere, be consolidated. And in this case, when we talk about big data, artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning can be applied to it, which, you know, lots of space to mature there and understand and, and lots of human trust issues with those capabilities, which are, are well-earned. But when you think about all the different layers and they talk about this as like a Google Maps and I think of it that way because it has topography each the weighting each of each one of them could be very different for the individual of what mattered more or what mattered more at that time so the the individual isn't going to be static over their life either or, or over the course of a pathological disease state and of course we want to cycle that information back through and make it usable and actionable so for spaceflight, one of the questions is, is precision always better or necessary? This is like, and I think I'm gonna, I see some faces different than maybe the crowds. So I'm gonna look at those for, for what they're gonna give me when I say this. It was better is the enemy of good enough, <laughs> which is, do we really need to spend money on that? Knowing more about that, knowing how to do it better? They're like, well, if you'd like to be sure that you can pull back 
and be good, not just lucky, yes, you have to spend the money on knowing for sure that that was a true statement. Um, but that that's a hard case when in a constrained resource environment. So we still very much rely on phenotype because again, it will take time and much research to really tell and it may not all come out of NASA for sure. I think we lean pretty heavily and I say we, the royal we, um, on you know the likes of NIH. Um, and now some large philanthropic organizations that are driving this sort of development of databases and health outcomes that are very interesting and very informative. So we do rely a lot on phenotype and talking to the crew, uh, measuring what we can. But could the system have performed better if it was more precise? Could, could we get to the point where we say, I could save you resources. If I spent the money on the research, could we know we could have pulled back on that? Exercise has come up over and over again from a crew ops time. Well, instead of doing an hour on the treadmill, can they do a half hour? Well, I'm not sure. You know, are the outcomes going to be the same with respect to cardiovascular conditioning or even bone density because there is loading involved? And lots of studies have attempted, but again, high degree of variability in the individual participants, really hard to get attack on was it safe to pull back? I think one of the areas they actually had success on was saying high intensity interval training was successful, which means you compress the time, increase the intensity of the activity to get the outcomes you want, but the exact protocol still very personalized. So medical care and countermeasures can be personalized. Um, you can, from an application standpoint, like with medication, you can manage dose with an individual duration of the treatment um, and then surveil the outcome. You know, maybe pull back on the medicine, see how they're doing, add it back if, you know, they fall back into a, a state where they think you think they need it. You know, modularity, how and when you apply things. So at least if you have it on board, and I'm going to get to this discussion in a second, you know, you can manage each crew member slightly differently. You know, you don't have to do a standard recipe per se, but whatever the technology application process, it needs to be there before we went. Um, it's very hard. We can you know, on ISS, they can 3D print some tools. And I know 3D printing seems like a good solution for a lot of things, but that kind of mission to Mars on the transit, you got to bring raw materials to 3D print. It gets complicated fast. Thinking about maybe planetary um, habitation might be where something like 3D printing might make sense, but we get into those types of solutions. But it, again, you really want to, you had to think about what the requirements most likely before they went in order to do the how and when I apply it later. Um, adjustability and, and some of the examples I came up were really like the Kentaver, you know, have laces, like simple solutions to certain things mean something's very adjustable to different sized human bodies rather than having to custom fit a garment to a body that will change over time in many different sized bodies. So you see this with the EVA suit, it's really challenging to build suits that work well for a very large anthropometric range pro prospectively. So they've really struggled with that. And I put the treadmill on here because of the harness. Now this one that you see in the picture was not very comfortable so we can improve how the fit is, but the concept that you, you could load someone very uniquely to them for their stature, for their body weight, for their load tolerance. Um, so those are the concepts that should be running behind people's minds. If I'm going to build an intervention, how do I make it adaptable and agile? Um, and then, of course, from a medical care perspective, ultrasound is our go-to diagnostic and potentially, and we have one of our panelists, Dr. Chris Lenhardt, can maybe talk about, it can be also be a treatment. Um, and kind of, while I know in the ER, use of ultrasound has been growing, I think NASA has really been at the forefront of pushing the limits of all the things we do with ultrasound. Um, and and it, it was very gratifying to see the success along the way uh, and, and what a magnificent tool it's become, but it it's, can't quite do all the things that we need. So again, going back to imaging and surveillance, those types of tools that, that could be very valuable, but we can't have one tool for every piece of a problem, not gonna be the size. And, and that's the same case on earth to the large extent. You might have offices you can fit, but the ideas from a cost and application and training perspective, each unique piece of hardware for every little thing is just not a reasonable solution. So preparing for exploration really relies on confident predictions that would truly benefit from understanding when precision matters. So again, a lot of work to get there to be able to know when you can back off. Um, our medical systems and, and the gentlemen are gonna 
speak after me, part of the panel can, can attest to this and give very specific examples. Those medical systems, the crew health systems are designed years, if not decades ahead. Um, and, and it's really challenging to make change sometimes. Um, there's inertia in the systems at many levels. So to make the case, we should approach this application and, and these resources differently has, has really met a lot of frustrating barriers. Um, decision support tools. So even when you establish the capabilities would really help determine when we could allocate space, the concept of a capability um, versus fill and fill it in with the specifics later. So that is that concept of scarring when you have to do it years and decades earlier, or you wanna be able to evolve the capability. So when they do the most extended mission or over missions, you could get refined risk management versus really just having to commit to the solution at the very start. Like if it's this space, this mass, this box goes there and this box does X, and that's what you're locked into for the next 20 years is, is really not the approach we wanna take. So we wanna be able to have evidence base and a business case to go to programs and help them understand why this should be approached differently than it has been in the past. So what did we do about this? So we did start down the genomic road, which, which helped move some of the policy forward with the one-year mission and the twin study. But what was really important about this work, and I'm glad we have John Charles on the line today, uh, Dr. Craig Kundry, Dr. Mark Shellhammer, were very important to the establishment and then the actual execution of this study because it ran for over three years um, in its totality, probably closer to five by the, get, by the time they get all the post plate data in and they're still gonna be publishing papers for a while but it was mapped to functional studies too. I mean, not that there was complete 100% 100 alignment, 100 alignment, but out of the box, you know, at least it had the conception of mapping all the way from a molecular level to the phenotype functional level to understand if there were relationships. At least it gave the data analysis a fighting chance of turning out some insights of things that might be highly correlative that we could lean back on and discovery of new biomarkers. You can't, you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes you have to go fishing in a science sense. Um, first, especially at, at molecular capabilities and trying to understand the sample quality to be able to generate hypotheses in the future. So I, it was really a groundbreaking study. Um, it was exciting to see happen. It's exciting to see the attention it gets, but also reiterating to people like, where do we go from here? And there is a follow on group of studies that are about this type of time course, because that's what matters. Um, you have to map how the body changes over time, and you're gonna have to do it a lot because of the individual variability, although some of the precision tools do help you look at individual as their own control. So that's kind of where we are with, with space flight research. So will this create opportunities for human space flight using systems medicine and precision medicine? No doubt, yes. It's gonna offer increased risk prediction accuracy, refined risk management, um, and informed resource allocation. Like th those are big wins for the human side to be able to go to the table programmatically and make the case for resources to do the work, resources to manifest the right approach and to be integrated into the vehicle in a way it's never been done before. Um, and then also be more precise about how we do our resource allocation and get to the point where we can make some decisions when the crew is selected to be even more on point for the people going, not just generically that we're sending humans, but these humans and what these humans need. So I'm gonna wind up now so we can hear from our other panelists and the, and the audience. So really phenomenal picture that was put out by NASA. It was, of course it was an RFP, so this is, this is an artistic rendering, but it is quite fabulous. And there's no doubt in my mind that space exploration functions to inspire and unite. Everywhere I go, every, not, I don't go very many places anymore other than virtually, but globally when I've given talks, um, the level of excitement and engagement, it really transcends any uh, boundary, geographically, religion, sex, at just everyone suddenly says, I want to be part of that. Um, and that has been a huge benefit of human space exploration. But everything that we do globally, internationally, and nationally, never act local, think global, is to be ready on this day, in this moment, for whomever is in that suit, I think precision is gonna be required. And uh, I think I'd like to be a part of that in whatever, whatever manner that may take, so. And I'm sure all of the listeners are joined in for that exact reason. 
So I appreciate your time and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Fogarty. Terrific, of course, as we expect, <laughs> and as always. And Thank I'm you. so glad that you, you, you clearly emphasized the personalized precision aspect, which I did not mention at all, at least explicitly in my introductory comments. And so the idea uh, that is really something certainly we can get back to maybe in the discussion, depending on what people are interested in. But, but that strikes me as particularly relevant to systematize, talking about systems medicine, how do you system, systematize the personalization so that it is not done on an ad hoc basis, including, including personalizing the understanding of a given individual's response to a very challenging environment and their individual capabilities regarding the goals of the mission. So I think you, of course, you're right on target with the personalization uh, precision part of it. And I'm especially intrigued by it because so many studies that I've seen, and I don't know, maybe the philosophy is changing a little bit, but so many of the studies that, that I've seen, it, even in the spaceflight realm, still seem to fall back on the idea of characterizing a population which you do in a classic laboratory or clinical study. And when you're talking about sending four or maybe six people at a time to Mars, something similar to the moon, what does a population even really mean? So not to denigrate population studies, but the personalization mm -hmm. aspect, I think, is going to be absolutely critical in a scenario where space flight organizations, including NASA, among others, can really take the lead in pushing that. So I'm, I'm not going to add, Jen, I'm not going to ask for your comments on that at the moment. I'm just going to okay. get out there for seeds for people to to be mulling over. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Antonson to see if he has any comments on that. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, there was a lot that Jen brought up in her talk that is really worth kind of bringing up and examining a little bit. And I'm gonna start where she left off. I took a, a number of notes while she was talking. Uh, the, the, the statement that precision is required. And, and I, first of all, I'm gonna say I agree with her after everything that I've seen, um, but it's worth understanding where we run into resistance to that idea and why. Um, there's always this fundamental question, do we need it? Do we need this for what we're attempting to do? Is it something that's gonna be materially helpful? Is it gonna reduce risk? Is it gonna be worth the cost? Are we gonna get the right return on investment on any of these things that we that we put an investment into? And uh, for, for, for several years, I worked as the chair of the Human System Risk Board and, and wrestled with this problem. Um, NASA has approached human spaceflight uh, in the context of risks. So when Jen mentions the five hazards of spaceflight, we derive about 30 risks uh, that, that are um, things that we recognize are risks to our crews, uh, to their successful performance of a mission, to their life, to the mission objectives that the agency has. And when we define things along those lines, we're doing that for a specific reason. It's because the systems of today are trying to figure out how to address an experimental problem. Human spaceflight, anytime it happens today, is experimental as opposed to the aviation industry where it's become, you know, in a sense, routine. There are experimental aspects of it, but you can get onto a commercial airliner and you don't worry about where your safety is at because the risks in that industry have largely been sorted out and measured and the safety has been proved to a certain level where we tend to think that the risk is worth the reward in these cases. So what is it like for something like spaceflight? Are we starting to get there for low Earth orbit? Mm, not really. I think it's all still experimental in low Earth orbit, especially with the advent of the commercial vehicles. What about when we're talking about going back to the moon or to Mars? I don't think anybody questions the experimental nature of those types of missions, but that's where risk really starts to rear its ugly head. And this is where that question of how much of a problem do we really have that justifies these investments in things like systems medicine, precision and personalized medicine, big data and AI and machine learning within these contexts, how much of a problem is there? And so some of the work that we're, uh, we've got in, in journal review right now comes out of uh, probabilistic risk analysis. If we look at a mission to Mars, the first mission to Mars potentially for two years, 
the shortest version, the shortest end of, of how long that's likely to take. We see numbers for risk to cruise that are loss of crew life. How likely is that to happen? They're sitting in the one in 90 domain. So what does that mean? Why, why does that matter to you? Well, the risk that astronauts got getting on the space shuttle for all cause failure was one in 90. The, the chance that the astronaut was gonna die because the vehicle exploded like in Challenger or because they had a problem coming back in uh, with like Columbia, when they got on that vehicle, that was about one in 90 chance that they were gonna die. That's roughly the same ballpark as B-17 pilots flying over Germany to do daylight bombing runs in World War II. That's a lot of risk. And our numbers suggest that the loss of crew life just due to medical conditions alone, illness and injury that will occur over a two year mission in Mars are probably in that same ballpark. So when we ask, is precision necessary? That's a question of how big is the medical risk? And then also how much room do we have to bring the stuff to deal with it? Now, I did a bachelor's and master's and a PhD in aerospace engineering before I went to, to medical school. And I worked in that domain. And in the life of every aerospace engineer, we are required to derive and solve the rocket equation for various cases of getting to low Earth orbit, getting to the moon, getting to Mars. And when you do that, go through all that math and you start to recognize just how constrained and how expensive it is to move mass from the surface of the earth up into these locations, whether it's in low earth orbit or all the way out to Mars, there's a visceral moment where every engineer, aerospace engineer at least, realizes, oh my, wow, this is really a hard problem. And that visceral moment is something that most of the engineers who have been working in human spaceflight have at the forefront of their mind when they hear the physicians and the life scientists and other folks say, hey, we need to do more stuff about the human. Their first response is, I've solved the math problem here. I know that we don't have any more room and you need enough air and you also need enough food and you also need enough um, propellant. And if you start taking away those things, the mission isn't gonna go well. So the tension that exists in that domain between that visceral sense of how hard the engineering problem is to solve to get to Mars versus now we're getting our arms around how much risk are we talking about in the medical domain if we look at going to Mars. Those two realities are starting to come crashing together. And we, we frame this in a risk sense because like I said, this is all experimental. We're trying to figure out what the right things to do are. How do we suss out what the systems of today need to become so that the systems of tomorrow have the same level of safety, reliability, and, 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 and understanding from the general public that the aviation industry eventually will have? There's no easy way to get there except through trial and error and figuring this stuff out and hopefully working it out through analogs and failing there rather than failing on the way to Mars. So, that's the sense, this tension that exists when we, when we try to design and make a recommendation that a system should include something. There's a couple of things that Jen brought up. One is AI and big data, machine learning. A lot of the, the precision and personalized medicine that's eventually gonna be, be part of what we need to do this successfully is gonna hinge on better and uh, more thorough ways of pulling in information as Jen was talking about at the beginning of her talk, right? It's not just one person going out and looking up, sitting at the library and trying to pull out books and read. We're talking about advances within the systems and the way that we handle data digitally so that information can be scraped and pulled from other parts of, of where research and, and clinical work and advances are being done and then brought forward in a sense that's already been sort of analyzed and interpreted. Now, anybody who's practicing medicine today, like Chris and I are, knows that there's a, there's a big difference between some of these aspirational goals of precision and personalized medicine within several different medical fields. Chris and I both practice as emergency medicine physicians, and I would say that the precision and personalized aspect of that practice is probably much further behind a variety of other fields in medicine. A lot of the initial dollars from the NIH that were dumped into precision medicine really went into oncology and things like that. Um, but what that does is it starts to open up this potential pathway 
how do we know when we're ready to move into the aspirational and move away from the things that we already know are effective? That's a big challenge. And it takes a systems approach to trying to understand and systematically, quantifiably, and repeatably come to reliable conclusions about what should we be doing and how do we design the crew vehicle system in these missions to actually make sure that we're reducing risk. Because it's not as simple as I think that many of the assumptions that people want to bring to this make. This is that, that tension from the engineering side of the community. We have been flying people just fine for six month missions on the space station for 20 years. And we really haven't had that many medical problems. Well, one, are you sure you're aware of all the medical problems? Because we really don't talk about them a lot from the privacy of information side of things. Um, and, and so there's always been a little bit of tension there between the flight surgeons coming forward and saying, hey, these are our concerns. The engineers saying, show us your evidence. And the flight surgeon saying, well, I can't really tell you about John Q. Astronaut and how he had all this trouble with urinary retention in his mission because that's his private personal information. It's not supposed to go out to the media, right? There is a, a challenge here that systems approaches to data and information, the way that it's governed, the security, the governance, and the um, accessibility to depersonalize and de-identified information can help to move that ball forward in ways that we historically haven't been able to do in spaceflight. But the challenge has always been our end is so small, right? When we talk about really saying that in order to move from the aspirational to the effective, how do we do that? How do we know that the evidence is enough? We can't always wait for that. We have to sometimes take those chances of designing the system to the best way that we think we can and then rolling that into the risk of the mission and hopefully learning the lessons of what happens afterwards. Now, the domain where Chris works, and, and I'm gonna give way to, to his thoughts on this in a second, at EXMC is particularly concerned with how do we design those systems? How do we actually make sure that we're thoughtful about the way we bring in what's useful? How do we make sure that we're building an evidence base that supports our decision to include an ultrasound or other medical capabilities that, that are something that, as the engineers say, we haven't necessarily had to visibly rely on in low Earth orbit that much. But when we start talking about the next step to the moon and the next step afterwards to Mars, when the risk is that big, we're gonna need that precision. We're absolutely gonna need that capability and we're gonna to need to figure out how to make the tough decisions about where mass and volume get sacrificed or we're gonna to have to do the research to shrink these things down and take advantage of expand the only thing that's, that's actually getting larger in our space flight system, which is data processing capability and data bandwidth. So I'm going to stop there and kind of throw the ball to Chris and see what your thoughts are on some of this. Actually, I'm going to catch that ball in, in mid-flight and just say for a couple of words before I toss it over to, over to Chris. So Eric, thank you. And you know, not surprisingly, just like Jen brought up some things like the personalized and precision approach that I had not talked about, you brought up and especially emphasized the risk approach, which is that's basically what NASA is all about, is managing those risks. And I know uh, a question that comes up, we've probably all fielded this question in various venues, is the idea of in-flight surgery. And I, I learned a lot, Eric, from hearing your responses to that. When you do the risk-benefit analysis on something like in-flight surgery, at least where it stands now, and we can quibble around the edges, but the magnitude of the resources that you would have to take to properly perform even a minimal kind of in-flight surgery removes the ability to take a bunch of other stuff to treat things that are much more likely and that are much more likely to contribute medical issues that are much more likely to contribute to the success of the mission not just the individual health of, of that particular astronaut. So that's, I think that's a, that's a pretty striking case in which you can actually start to comprehend some of the risk benefit analyses. And the other main point that, that you make, which, which I try to make as well, and you compare it, yeah, you compared it very nicely to wartime casualties. And also on the other side, 
to uh, air travel, when you're still when you're talking about going in, people have been going into space for on the order of 60 years, and it's still on the order of just 600 people or so. It's all experimental. It's all still experimental. You might say that again, yeah, we're going on a routine schedule, and we're um, made somewhat routine the ability to get there. But make no mistake, it's still every time you go, you're sending, you're learning something new, and it's experimental. So that ties back to your one of your major points, which is that maybe we should be treating all of that medical data as experimental data, and therefore that starts getting into the area of, of personalization of the data and confidentiality and uh, and privacy. Very big policy issues, right? Which we may or may not get to today. That may be the that may be the focus of another mini symposium that we have. So with those intriguing thoughts, I'll turn it over to Dr. Leinhardt. Thank you, Dr. Schellheimer. Appreciate it. And uh, again, thank you as well for the, the invitation to be here today. And uh, hello to all of you out there who are watching and hopefully learning as much as I am um, from our panelists so far. Uh, Dr. Fogarty's approach to, to systems medicine and as Dr. Antonsen described systems medicine I think brings us back to what Dr. Shellhammer started off by saying, which is there's lots of different ways that we could look at this problem of systems medicine and, and define it. And so building upon what's been discussed so far, um, but also uh, extending the definition of systems medicine into the work of exploration medical capability in the human research program at NASA, I'm going to focus more on the how we can apply a systems approach to designing medical capability uh, and how we can apply a systems approach to designing all human health and performance or crew health and performance capabilities for exploration missions. And I want to start off by saying that one of the great things about the work um, that I do at XMC um, is the team that I work with. And the reason that I think this is so important is because, as Dr. Fogarty mentioned, this is an area of medicine that, that lends itself very well to being interdisciplinary. And I think that the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we're doing in XMC is critical to our success. And so to build on that, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what Dr. Antonsen mentioned, which is how do, we, how do we figure out what the right stuff is to take with us? Um, if we can't take everything we want, um, because we know there are going to be constraints on us, whether they are mass or volume constraints, whether or not they're power or data constraints, there will be constraints on what we can take. Um, and we can't take everything we want. And so therefore we have to start making decisions. And the challenge we have is that making those decisions today, we're trying to plan for missions that are years, if not decades in the future. And so the decisions we make today have to be flexible, but they also have to take into account the changes that may occur over time. And so as we're looking at how we're going to pick the right stuff to take, we end up with what is essentially from a mathematics perspective, something called the backpack problem, which is I can only take so much stuff. I can only have so much volume, so much mass that I can have with me. How do I pick the right things? And so if you go to any physician, and you ask them, what do you want to take to Mars? They will start giving you lists upon lists of stuff. Uh, and the reason is, is because physicians approach problems in terms of, at least emergency physicians approach problems like this in terms of what's the worst possible thing that can happen and give me everything I need to deal with the worst possible thing. Well, one of the things we've learned in the medical system design process is that when you have physicians alone doing it, you end up with this list of terrible things that could happen. You end up with a whole bunch of stuff that you may or may not need. Um, and then you have our engineering colleagues coming back at us and saying, prove that you need this thing. Why are you actually taking it? What is the likelihood of something bad happening? And so at NASA, one of the things that we try to do when we're looking at this system design problem is think in terms of both the likelihood and the consequence of events. But we also have to add into that some additional factors. 
And those are the futility of an event if it occurs or the complexity of managing the event if it were to happen. And so to Dr. Shellhammer's point, surgery in space is a great capability to have as long as the likelihood of the condition is high enough, as long as the consequence of the condition is high enough, and as long as the complexity, the complexity is manageable. And that's where we get into trouble when we're looking at taking an operating room to space, for example. And so when we try to think about the system design approach for medical systems in the future at NASA, in XMC, we have engineers and we have scientists and we have doctors working together to try to answer these questions. And to come back to a point that Dr. Fogarty made, we sometimes need help making these types of decisions. And so one of the areas that we are currently working on is we are building something called a trade space analysis tool. And I am not an engineer. So for those non-engineers in the audience, I did not know what a trade space was or what trade space analysis was when I first started working at NASA. And so for as in the way of explanation, I would define a trade space analysis as if I have to choose between X and Y, how do I make the best possible decision? How do I make an evidence-based decision and how to make, make one that is repeatable over time? And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to eliminate individual variability. So as Dr. Fogarty mentioned, lots of people have experience bases, um, but we're trying to use the best available evidence base to make these decisions. And so a trade space analysis tool ultimately can help us to look at different system designs to determine which one can help us to best answer the backpack problem. If I only have this much space to take stuff with me, how do I figure out what the best stuff is to fit in there? And so we power this kind of trade space analysis tool with a medical evidence base on all of the conditions that are likely to occur in space flight or have a high consequence if they were to occur in space flight. We then also have to have resources and resource tables that help us to figure out if something like that does happen, how do I know all of the stuff I need to manage it effectively? And then I also have to know how effective my treatment can be, even if I have all of the stuff that I need with me. And when we have all that information, we can put it through a computational engine, which does probabilistic risk assessment and helps us to determine if the stuff that we have designed into a medical system will actually help us reduce the risk. And so it runs this probabilistic risk assessment using hundreds, if not thousands of simulated missions that we define all their parameters. And we can see how often a given condition occurs. We can see what the consequences of those conditions might be. And we can see which resources are used most frequently in these missions. And once we start to run those analyses, we can start to optimize our medical system design in a way that maximizes the use of everything on board and minimizes us taking stuff to space that we never use. If I fly something on the way to Mars as part of the medical system and that thing never gets used, in essence, it was a brick and it never helped us. And it was mass and volume that we should have used somewhere else. And so the, the ultimate plan is to try and use trade space analysis tools to help us improve our medical system design process. And we want to do that not only in an interdisciplinary fashion, but in a holistic fashion when we look at the vehicle as a system. The spacecraft is a system in and of itself. It is made up of many, many subsystems. A human in a vehicle is a system in and of itself, made up of many, many subsystems. And all of these subsystems and systems interact with each other and interface with each other. And so if we design a medical system that optimizes for the medical risk, we will have bought down the medical risk as much as we can. But as Dr. Anderson mentioned, if I bring in an, an external defibrillator to Mars that I don't need, and as a result, I don't take enough water, I may not actually be helping the crew as much as I need to. 
And so we need to be able to look at the total mission risk, look at our medical system design in the face of the total mission risk, and then start to optimize not only the medical system, but the entire crew health and performance system and the vehicle itself towards reducing total mission risk as much as possible. And at the end of the day, our goal at NASA is to run these missions, to safely fly our astronauts and bring them home again, um, and to achieve our mission objectives to the best of our ability. And using these types of tools will help us to not only design the right systems, but also make sure that all the systems integrate and interface properly in a way that truly buys down the risk in its aggregate form and not in individual pieces. And so from a, a systems medicine perspective, the approach that XMC is taking towards this problem is to try and think about system design in a new way, in an interdisciplinary way that is as holistic as possible. And so with that, I will pass it back to Dr. Shellhammer and uh, let's see where we go from here. Yeah, <clears throat> Dr. Leinhardt, thank you very much. That was, uh, and so let me make it, first of all, a, a logistical bookkeeping announcement. We're gonna open it up here for a discussion among our three panelists, if in fact they have anything to say to each other or that they wanna discuss for about 10 or 15 minutes, 20, see how interesting it is. But uh, this would be a good time to start, those of you in the audience who would like to, to start typing your questions into the chat box. Uh, those questions will be, uh, will be vetted and, and some of them probably won't be able to accommodate them all. Uh, will be vetted by the by our crack staff that's online and then they will be read by them to the uh, to the panel members so this would be a good time to get those things in there the more provocative the better um so chris the things that the stuff that i but of course I, I liked all that all that and you again you brought another yet another perspective to what we might mean by systems medicine but you uh, the engineering approach that you described that reminded me of what someone once heard someone say about uh, overhearing a group of engineers talking about something that they had designed and how this was so great that they that it was so well so over engineered that it was able to accommodate all these things that people had that that it wasn't originally designed for and this person's point was these people are not necessarily good engineers. They didn't do their job because over-engineering it means you're using more resources than you really needed to accomplish what you were told to accomplish. And those resources could very well have been used somewhere else. Now, as an engineer by training, it's hard to come to terms with that because you wanna say, if I just put in an additional 5% of resources, Look at the new capabilities that I can that I can give you, but that's not what I was asked to do. And it's not just you're not just flying my device, my apparatus. So I get it. On the other hand, and this is I'll throw this out. Probably the three of you have some some other things you might want to discuss, but I'll also dangle this idea out there too. Where do you draw the line in a, in in keeping in mind the fact that these systems overall have to address the unexpected. So how do you design a medical system that's nominally based on mitigating the known medical risks when you know very well that there's gonna be one that you haven't thought of? In that case, you would say, well, then we over-engineer the things that we know about, so we'll have excess capability to deal with the unknown. But is that the right answer? I don't know if that's the right answer. With that, I will leave it out, I'll, I'll toss it up. Whoever speaks first gets the floor. Yeah, I'll uh, take on your first question there on over-engineering. And I think that it's a, it's a very important one to, to kind of suss out. So uh, a lot of what Chris is describing in terms of the way that they're going about trying to solve that backpack problem, right? What do we put in there? is actually intended to try to keep the system from being over-engineered from that perspective. And this is where we gotta make a, a, a sort of a separation between what is the research work that's required to actually characterize and understand the magnitude of the problem we're dealing with 
And that's then leads into what are the solutions to that problem in the design space, right? So this is this is why the, the risk approach from NASA right now is it's a sign of the times. It's not necessarily an enduring approach. You do this because we don't know. We don't know how big some of these problems are. There's a number of those risks that we can look at. Jen brought up the pharmaceutical problems, right? That's a risk that NASA thinks is green all the way up until a Mars mission. And then when you get to a Mars mission, we've painted it red in large part because we don't know for two reasons. We don't know how long the medicines are gonna last in that environment. And we also don't really know how the body is responding to that spaceflight environment and changing how it responds to medications, right? So part of this is about trying to figure out through the research paradigm, what are the things we need to care about so that in the end equation, that system is not over-designed, that system is not over-engineered, and that you haven't taken away the important mass, volume, and power allocations from other parts of the system. So, so Chris's point of, we gotta think about the total mission risk is key, right? But this, this risk-based approach of today is designed to get to the right answers, get the ballpark so that that system doesn't end up being over-engineered. We've got medical things on, that, on the ISS that we've had up there for 20 years never used. Does that mean that we shouldn't send them to Mars? I, I don't know, it's a different problem, right? So how do we bring that evidence base forward to do that? The way that I think it's important to keep in mind, the way that we're trying to do that is to try to say, how can we shrink that unknown box to as small as possible, right? When we do the accepted medical conditions list problem, what we do is we say, okay, let's map out all the stuff that we've got to have for the preventive stuff that we need. We, you know, we need the hygiene stuff. We need the medicines that anybody needs for whatever conditions they have. Uh, they're going to be doing these activities. We're going to have this many, you know, uh, um, conferences a week to try to, to look them over. Uh, here's all the stuff we know we're going to need. And then there's that question of what about the stuff that isn't going to happen, that, that might not happen, but if it does, it's a big problem. So EXMC has kept an exploration medical conditions list for years, which is like hundred medical conditions. Only 47 of those have happened in space flight. 53 of them have not happened in space flight, but a whole bunch of them happened on the ground to astronauts in between missions, ranging from things like dysrhythmias to heart attacks to strokes. And many of those cases, those folks were flown again after being fixed. And so that's part of the, what don't people realize you know, about, about where that risk lies, is that just because it hasn't happened in space to date doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. How do we figure out what the odds are for that? And that's trying to mash that down into the smallest, all that unknown into the smallest domain possible. The likelihood of the heart attack, we can probably get our hands around that. The likelihood of the kidney stone, which by the way is listed as a red risk right now for NASA, we may be, maybe had one case in the history of space flight and it's a maybe, right? We don't really know. So is that one really something that's red? This whole process is trying to figure out where are these potential magnitudes of problems so that we don't over-design systems. That's what I think is really a big takeaway on that from the engineering perspective. <laughs> don't, don't disagree on anything, but I think perspective you know, coming from a programmatic level, you don't make those decisions alone, right? So the, the idea is to be able to articulate and to the greatest degree quantify, right? And I think part of the interdisciplinary nature that's mentioned in systems medicine or, or systems engineering approach to this is that you gotta be able to communicate to each other, right? Help someone understand what it is you are managing what risk you're protecting for, why? And I, and I wrote down like the concept of the over-engineering, well, that could be gratuitous or it could mean adaptable, right? Just the generic term is like, it depends, you know, the legal answer. <laughs> we should be neither arbitrary nor capricious. So tell me the why, like, were you trying to create something that had adaptability knowing that you needed to protect for more or even the unknown? So I agree with you that precision medicine could grow and mature in a way that we could get our arms more around the I don't know what I don't know. So there's the intersection in spaceflight between being human, changing over time, and disease processes happening that you were destined to have. I remind folks, like, again, going back to the 19,927 genes that aren't actionable, and I'll get hammered for that somewhere along the way, but the idea is, for the most part, 
they're your potential, not necessarily your destiny. We're trying to figure out how much you're destined, you know, driving your destiny here with that to give us insight into what we're really protecting for and who who might be more vulnerable. Going back to, could you have eas- more as just as easily had that heart attack or stroke on a mission because you were destined to have it? I mean, we go and screen and do MRIs and look for, you know, vulnerabilities in the vascular space and any number of hallmarks of something where someone could be you know, uh, vulnerable to a, like a hemorrhagic stroke, but there are other kinds that you're not going to see coming, right? That, that happen for a different reason. And then we do have a provocative environment that could tip the scales toward an event. So to build an overly constrained medical system means you're putting in yourself in a position to not mitigate risks that you can't accurately predict. So you, you, you bring that story forward and, and even in the big healthcare system, because it's a business, right? And even if you think of, of space flight, ultimately a program manager in the administration, managing schedule, budget, success of missions, public affairs, the idea is what value do you add and is it value enough to put resources on it? Now, you know, Chris's point is you do get down to the nuts and bolts where you're competing between your own resources like food, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide removal. <laughs> there is that level. So total mission risk is real. But we had to get ourselves in a place where we could get it on the table. There was a history there where I don't even think the life sciences, life sciences work, the medical system or crew health and performance system was in a posture to even get on the table in a way that, you know, a systems engineering approach could ingest it. But I think the decision could be made more transparently at the program level of what you will and will not protect for or what system will you make more or less adaptable because it is a cost benefit analysis against other needs and until it's all on the table at the same time I don't think we're making a very educated choice you know it's it's being done again in a silo at a low enough level that it (coughs) appeared right enough but we didn't know that there were other opportunities to exchange resources so one of the areas I tend to poke on you know with clinical analysis is you know, we should not have an analytic capability that's different for understanding if the water quality is good and potable, the air quality is good and potable, and what you can measure in blood products or urine. Like, let's go find a system that can address all of those liquids and or gases, because it should be as agnostic as to the source. It's what you're looking for, you know, and and different types of technologies have come up about that. Like, could we get there? Can we push the limits on that and not have to choose between knowing whether the water is clean and the air is pure enough to, to still, you know, not contaminated. And that, you know, if you had symptoms and you had to run a blood diagnostic or you're trying to monitor somebody over time, like, what, isn't that an over engineering concept that shouldn't be gratuitous, it should be adaptable. And is that where an investment would make sense? And maybe in the end benefit resources being saved. Um, So I don't know, there's lots of different ways we can get there, but I think we did make headway. And I think the organization as a whole recognizes, you know, since the CABE report, and that was a big pusher for this with the Health and Medical Technical Authority, you're talking about the risk management, the hazards. That was a new um, paradigm shift, I think, that actually was a maturation process, part of the maturation process for life sciences um, that needs to continue to be refined. And we need to be honest. You know, so, and, and they're hard decisions to make. I think, you know, Chris pointed out a lot of them that it's it's not easy going, but when, you, you know, kind of sets the model of whether you be remote healthcare, wilderness medicine, you know, austere environments, third world countries, you know, healthcare is rationed all the time. We just don't talk about it that way. You know, somebody had to make a choice about priorities of, of what was supplied or what was taken or what was available. Sometimes, you know, we don't agree with the choices, but it was like, well, who laid it all out on the table to figure out, you know, how this was going to com- position us for the best outcome. NASA has a very, you know, a mission driven um, activity going on. Sometimes the mission is more than one, but, you know, it's a, it's a need, it's a driver. It's, it's very, it, it kind of consolidates the problem discussion a little bit. I think that can help set a bit of a model, at least a thought process and allow us to engage in a discussion that is has quantifiable aspects to it. I noticed that you're um, studiously avoiding the word optimize or optimization when you talk about system adaptability. 
<laughs> I, I learned a long time ago that, that that was a trigger word for people that once that came out of your mouth, it was hard to, to put it back in the box. So you say it, it is possible that you could optimize one and it could really be beneficial, but it has this lingering flavor of you, if you're optimizing, you're too rich and, and you got to you got to give back. And so it's yeah, the, the scars are too language. much time in NASA. It's a language barrier. Yeah, I'm working on it. That and I'm trying to use acronyms less. I think I did OK. Um, one of the things that you made me think about was, uh, you know, as we think about adaptable systems and as we struggle with this, there are plenty of places that Chris and I experience in the hospital and the systems of medicine right now where the systems themselves end up depersonalizing the medicine because of the reliance on the population type of information and evidence base that you've talked about. And, you know, anybody who's who's had to um, sit there and, and answer a fallout from, from uh, Medicare evaluations about sepsis criteria when we're treating patients and asking why you didn't give all of the fluids to that congestive heart failure patient that the sepsis criteria required. It's, it's that, 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 population-based one-size-fits-all overall set of uh, kind of top-down information that constrains the adaptability and the, the insight that the physicians and nurses and, and, and other healthcare providers kind of bring to the individual patient. And the, the whole industry is struggling with how do we get from that place where the system depersonalizes medicine to where the system enables personalized medicine. And, and that's a transition that's that's working, we're in the process of trying to do right now terrestrially. And hopefully, you know, eventually as space medicine, be, you know, kind of comes into its own with commercial space flight kind of starting to take off here, that, that that'll be one of those areas that space medicine can leapfrog over would, would be my hope, right? Is, is the implementation of systems medicine <laughs> as something that is, is regressive and painful to the to the physicians or the nurses rather than something that is enabling and risk reducing and providing that return on investment that we're all seeking there um, and that really stems from the policy discussions that you talked about before right how do you have people who are making those policy decisions for what's appropriate to provide that top-down information for and what information are they drawing from from the evidence world that helps them to make those in a smart way so I'll, I'll be brief and then I know there's, I hope there's questions in the chat for us to address. Uh, I just wanted to come back, Dr. Shellhammer, to your original point, which was how do, we, how do we predict the unpredictable? How do we, how do we know what's coming before it happens? Uh, and I think one of the ways that we are hoping to do this um, from, a, from a NASA perspective is to take analog environments on earth and, and in different places around earth where austere medicine is practiced and try to find ways of pushing those into space. Uh, and that often has to do with having uh, devices or capabilities that have multiple functions. So building on what Dr. Fogarty was saying there earlier about why would I fly three separate devices when they all fundamentally might do the same thing and I just need them for different uses. But the other part of it is the very human side of it, and that is the, the knowledge and skills and abilities of the people on board um, and their ability to adapt to different circumstances and to, for, we, I don't know the correct term for this because everyone just calls it MacGyvering. And I feel like that's a, like a known term nowadays, but, but we need the ability to MacGyver our way out of medical problems on a mission to Mars, because ultimately a condition will occur on the way to Mars that we did not anticipate. It is almost a certainty that that will happen. Uh, we've seen it in the history of human spaceflight. We know that things come up in people that we were not anticipating. Uh, we have to anticipate that something will happen <laughs> that we did not anticipate. Uh, and so the over-engineering concept makes it sound bad, but to a certain extent, we may want a capability that gives us that one extra thing that we're not sure we're going to use it, but if they can include it in this device, in this capability, in a way that doesn't have a large negative impact on the rest of the mission, then those are added bonuses that we should be willing um, to, uh, to either fund or accept when we're looking at these capabilities. So, knowing and believing that something will happen uh, that you were not anticipating is, is what 
at least our past experience has shown us. Uh, and if we have the people on board with the knowledge, skills, and ability to adapt to their situation, and we have multifunctional and adaptive capabilities and technologies on board that we can use for many different purposes, um, we will present ourselves with the best possible way of dealing with that unanticipated event if and when it does occur. Yeah. So, Eric, I'll let I'll let you say I'll let you I'll let you speak for a minute. We'll go to some audience questions. I think Chris's point is really important about the human, right? What are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that the human crew has to deal with this? And it's not just the human crew. In the way that we do space flight today, a huge portion of the things that are done are either done completely by or supported by mission control and folks on the ground. And this is why one of the risks that we carry, this human system integration architecture risk, is something that you have to think about when you dovetail with the concept of what are the medical risks that we worry about, right? The whether it's a, you know, the human needs repair and maintenance, just like the vehicle needs repair and maintenance. The amount of things that happened to the vehicle in the ISS lifetime that were likely to kill the crew if they didn't have 80 plus experts in mission control available in real time, not only like helping the crew, but doing a lot of things for them. That number is about 1.7 events per year from our analysis. And in the first six years of the ISS, that was closer to three to four times a year. So when you start moving away from Earth towards Mars and you start getting real-time communications that lag and you have a 45 minute turnaround time for that type of support and you don't have the ability for those experts at mission control to you know, figure out what's going on with the cooling system that's failing and how does the crew respond without causing more problems, that's another set of problems, not just the repair and maintenance of the human, but the repair and maintenance of the vehicle that depends on the crew's functionality, their knowledge, skills, and ability. How do you get that from 80 people, experts in their areas in mission control, stuffed into the heads of four people or the heads of four people plus the systems that you have on the vehicle itself? And that challenge is something that cannot be understated. You know, I'm a I'm a practicing physician and I think that the medical risk is huge in a Mars mission, but I actually think that the human systems integration risk is bigger. Um, and that's part of why I want the medical risk to be solved is so that the crew can actually fix the problems that are gonna happen with the vehicle. In the same way that Chris talks about unknown, unexpected things are gonna happen with people, unexpected things are always happening with all of our experimental space vehicles and systems. So the part of the reason to keep them healthy is so they can deal with those problems and actually make it all the way through the mission from that perspective. And, and that's a part of it that I think we can't forget about because as you start pushing further out and you lose those advantages that Jen was talking about in her talk, it's not just a medical problem. It's a total system problem. Yeah, I, I like, as, as somebody with an engineering background myself, I, that's, I tend to think of it that way too, as the human, as part of the system. It's very much what Chris was talking about uh, as well. And so it's not just the job of the medical capability to keep the people alive and well has an ethical issue. It's part of it to keep them alive and well so that they can keep the mission goals intact and accomplish as much of those mission goals as, as possible. I mean, it's a little bit of a cavalier way of looking at the human as like, we wouldn't care about your health and safety if you didn't have a job to do. But to some extent that is the case. I mean, we wouldn't send them into space if they didn't have something to do. I'm not gonna ask for your comment on that, Dr. Fogarty, unless you have one. I'll turn it over to my crack staff of uh, uh, Nabila, Ben, and Dorothy. Of course. So first of all, thank you to our panelists for speaking today. We've gotten a lot of very interesting audience questions and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can in our limited time. To begin with, we have gotten a couple of questions on the topic of surgery in space. So we have uh, Dr. Rowena Christensen who asks, with surgery in space, many articles and independent studies focus on appendectomy, but I understand the probabilistic risk of appendicitis is relatively low and conservative management exists. Is this the best focus for surgery in space research? And we also have an additional question related to this from John Charles, who asks, 
Uh, surgery in space is all well and good, but what about post-op recovery and rehab? This will be resource intensive. Um, you guys mind if I take a swing at that one first? Because I think this one is, is a fascinating one that we get a lot, right? And appendicitis is oftentimes held up as sort of the what famous what if case for surgery in space, right? What if somebody gets appendicitis? Well, um, what if they get an open globe? What if they have a torsed ovary? What if they have, you know, anything that falls into the domain of any other type of surgeon than a general surgeon? Should we be bringing those people instead? Should we be planning out the surgical kits for that? Um, should we prioritize an ophthalmologist because that's the case that we were looking at? The, 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 question, the person who's asking the question makes a great point. The standard of care has been changing terrestrially for something like appendicitis, right? Um, there's a, a lot of evidence that supports, you know, the ability to give antibiotics and then have a wait and see approach to that. And, and oftentimes it can delay the need for surgery by well over a couple of years. Um, and so as medicine advances, the question of whether or not surgery is the right thing for appendicitis in general is, is changing terrestrially. We did do some probabilistic risk assessment, um, looking at the risk versus benefit of appendectomy or cholecystectomy, removing the gallbladder uh, uh, before you send people out on space flight. And what we kind of ended up coming to was that probabilistically, it kind of ends up in the wash from a risk perspective, because as you take away that problem, you start to increase the likelihood of small bowel obstruction and other problems. So the benefit of actually trying to like do that prophylactically before space flight is, is really suspect. Um, so do you need that capability in space? Well, as John Charles is pointing out, post-op care and the rehabilitation and potential post-op infections and other things like that are part of what roll up into what Chris was talking about from the perspective of complexity. You are breaking up a little bit, but I get your main points, partly because I've heard you say them before. So but let me extrapolate a little bit on that because the other thing that, I, that I've heard uh, uh, relevant to the, related to this topic is uh, the post-operative care means that you don't just have one person out of commission, the patient, you have essentially taken another person out of commission who, who's effectively providing nursing and medical care for that person for some period of time. And it, it can be tapered off, clearly, you hope. But this, again, is the idea you got to look at the, uh, you got to look at the whole thing. What's the crew there for? they are not there primarily as medical caregivers. They're there to do other, other things. So, okay, great. Um, I, do, I think we've covered that specific topic sufficiently. We could go on and on. Let's go, let's go to another audience question. Of course. So our next question, we have a question from Robert Plout Snyder, who says, thanks for these three excellent presenters. Now that spaceflight is beginning to embark on the commercialization of space with individuals flying who will never be fully vetted by NASA medical ops, how does that impact profiling risk of individuals and the downstream consequences? You ready? Yeah, I'll say one thing that I, that I at least from my venture so far on the experiment, the research side of commercial spaceflight, but from what I gather about the policy, what everybody wants to do is set the bar as low as possible, not to be cavalier about health and safety, but because it's a commercial venture. You want to fly everybody, ideally everybody who can afford to fly. So then the idea becomes figuring out where that, where that line is, if in fact there is a line. But that's, that's, what, I, that's what I know about the medical side of things. Jen? Sure, it, you know, and the FAA, FAA has been put in this position of, um, you know, center of excellence, and there are conversations occurring across the commercial providers. And of course, any commercial provider that's going to a NASA asset like ISS, there, there's going to be rules of engagement because once you leave the commercial vehicle, if you were to come on to the NASA vehicle, you become a NASA liability, right? So th there has to be some information and some understanding and you know rob has some history doing statistics with nasa very familiar that a lot of this is and i meant to mention this before and i think eric was making the point about different conditions and probabilities 
that when you're dealing with essentially 600 ends of one, you're, you're, you're kind of like in the rare disease domain of how you have to go and look at this information, not, not real epidemiology. And we've always struggled with like, even who is a control population for the astronauts? Like so highly educated, they're you know, self-motivated. They've got all these characteristics that doesn't make them look like the general population. We already took like, discussed like no one's average, but in this case, if the commercial sector is going on their own way, to, whether it's like inspiration four, where they're in the same vehicle for a number of days, or they're going to go to a commercial uh, facility uh, that might be developed. You know, we're trying to negotiate how to learn, right? And use something like standard measures to continue to characterize a lot of these people, as much as they're going as, you know, paying customers want to enjoy the experience. There is a level of altruism. Like I, I want to contribute. I want to be astronaut. Like I want to do a job. I want to, <laughs> I want to facilitate something while I'm there. So they have, for the most part, I believe been very open with, participating, volunteering for studies to start to characterize how low we can set the bar. Are people as, is this environment as provocative or how provocative really is it to them if they have underlying conditions? We make a lot of assumptions and rule people out really based on conservatism with a lot of speculation. Like we, I think both Eric and Chris mentioned, like, you don't, you don't want, we don't, we don't want to fail during the real mission. So this is why you do analog missions, you know, give yourself a safe place to get to that line, but not go over the line. You don't want to hurt the person. You don't want to hurt the mission. Um, so commercial space is, is opening that space up, breaking some of that barrier. But I think, you know, they're constrained to limited duration missions, which actually constrains the risk um, to a significant amount. Uh, but I don't know, you know, even the suborbital flights taking up certain people, you're like, that that's not, that's not nothing, you know, taking a 90 year old up for a ride for, for 20 minutes and landing them in the desert and things can go wrong and landings can be hard. And, um, you know, people can have events, as you said, I mean, there are clocks going on in all of our different cells that we don't understand. <laughs> so, um, it, it's always risky sending people for various reasons. As everyone mentioned, there's a lot you don't know, but I think their participation in something like a standard measures approach you know, trying to characterize people, trying to get the pre-post consequences physiologically, you know, medically, clinically, um, they've opened the door to that, you know, but it's not unanimous, right? And it's not as if everyone signed up, it's still a negotiation. Um, so it's kind of to be determined how we're gonna learn from each other uh, along the way. However, it is in the best interest of commercial space, I believe, to continue to participate so that they know the risk they're taking. Um, we, there have been lots of discussions with lawyers in the room, you know, about liability. Okay, do you really have inform, uninformed informed consent? You know, a lot of people online might be familiar with that, you know, conundrum. It was like, well, I can inform you that I can't tell you all the bad things that could happen to you. Do you agree to go? And they're like, where, where do I sign? So, um, I, I don't know it stopped many people, um, that part of it, the dollar signs might have been more of a deterrent than the, than the theoretical risk of it. But yeah, that, that is an exciting opportunity, but it's also to be determined how it'll be executed and, and how we could all benefit from it and do a systems approach with very diverse sets of people going. And to what extent those, that population, population, I'll use that term advisedly, the, the commercial space flight participants can provide data that might be useful to NASA. Generally speaking, a different type of a different population of people, but clearly some overlap and humans are human. So there are right. there really would be some generalizability. Okay, while I have the floor, I'm gonna ask for another question from the audience. Of course. So related to this challenge that Dr. Fogarty was talking about with individualizing medicine, we have this question from the audience asking, thinking about creating a truly inclusive spaceflight environment, how would it be best, or is it even possible to address bias when creating personalized or precision me medicine profiles? Wow, one of our physician uh, panelists might want to address that. So, first of all, am I choppy or can you hear me this time? Good for right now. I'll stop all right, we'll, choppy. Yeah, we'll hope it holds up for a second. Oh. Bias in clinical medicine is a big deal and it's all over the place. And we learn over time where 
the evidence base that we have from the population level has been uh, impacted by bias in the way that studies were designed or the way that the data was collected or things like that. And we keep learning. And we're honestly, we're going to keep finding these things as we uh, mature any of these fields. So part of the responsibility of building an evidence base and part of the responsibility of maturing that evidence base, when we think about where do we go to inform guidelines and things like that, things like the Cochrane reviews, right, systematic reviews of evidence, they all have ways of trying to identify and categorize bias within the evidence base. And it's not a perfect system, right? So I don't think that in the space flight world where we have less evidence, far less evidence than we have in the terrestrial world, that we're going to be leading the way in terms of eliminating bias. We are inherently biased because the people who have flown in space to date that make up this, um, the evidence base that we do have are by and large, mostly white male. Um, there's been a fair amount of females. Um, there has been an expansion of diversity in recent years, but for the 60 years of space flight, it's been dominated by a certain type of person who looks a certain way. And that's just the data. That is the evidence base that we have available to us. Now, it is our responsibility to make sure that that evidence base broadens out. I think commercial space flight is going to help play a big role in that. I think that NASA's policy changes help play a big role in that. But I don't think we should fool ourselves about space medicine being able to lead the way in that domain just because that's the reality of what we've had to deal with in collecting evidence so far. And um, I think that this is an argument for what Jen was talking about earlier when she was laying out the, the need for the evidence base to be high level, as high level as we can make it, is a responsibility to identify and, and address bias in research wherever we can. And I think that also just as a kind of a closing note on that thought, the European Space Agency has opened up para-astronaut applications. They're looking at folks from a disability perspective. Now, the question mark of what has been the right stuff as defined by the book and the movie and the original seven Mercury astronauts and the mythology that surrounds that really is now getting challenged and questioned by the first 90 year old in space and the opening of a para-astronaut selection process and the first person with uh, a prosthetic who was one of the people on the Inspiration4 missions, right? So, so there is going to be a time uh, of reckoning for us to make sure that we're holding our evidence collection to the highest standards in terms of ensuring we minimize bias, but it's always something that's there and always something that we just have to try to work around. And it's true for terrestrial medicine as it is for space medicine. Yeah, Chris, did you have anything to say about that? I just wanted to add that, uh, and Dr. Fogarty could certainly speak to this as well, but we, we may not be able to control who flies right now from a data gathering perspective. We just take all the data we can get from anybody that's gonna fly. Um, from a research perspective though, in the human research program, we have been intentional in the way that we recruit subjects for our research. Um, and trying to build up a more diverse population that feeds into the research results that we get through our work in the human research program has been an intentional effort to try and address some of the historical biases that we've seen in the data that is relevant to space flight. So there is a way to do this uh, and be intentional about it from a, at least the research perspective. Maybe in the future, we can also do this and be more intentional from selecting who gets to fly based on trying to round out our, our information um, from a human spaceflight perspective. But at the moment, we do have control somewhat over the, the research side of it and trying to remove some of our historical biases that exist. Very good, thank you. Okay, so this is the part where we come to the most difficult uh, time when we come to the most difficult part of the whole symposium, which is that I have to start bringing this to a close because we have staff members and various people online uh, supporting this. Two of our panelists are physicians and I cannot afford to pay them overtime, not even close. Um, so uh, we will, this sounds like a good, a great topic to start with. I'm clearly, I'm glad for everyone who was able to attend and participate. I'm sorry if you submitted a question and didn't get to it. We may revisit this topic. 
And we have a number of other topics, including things like uh, how you do the appropriate statistics in a small n setting like human spaceflight. That may or may not be the topic of our next mini symposium, but look for topics like that coming along, commercial space flight, things like that. So I'm going to go in reverse order of how they originally spoke and just ask my esteemed panelists if they have a word that they would like to end with, Dr. Leinhardt. A single word, like I have to pick one, <laughs> one special word to end with? For you, you get all sentence. <laughs> Uh, I think I would, uh, I appreciate this topic being discussed and I appreciate the concept of systems medicine being discussed in this forum, but I would, I would argue that uh, this, it's not something that is unique to spaceflight in any way, shape or form. And one of the things we see in our work in medicine today is that everyone has been siloed and everyone has been specialized and Everything boils down to systems and individual systems and not necessarily the holistic approach to the patient as a whole. And so on any given day in the emergency department, I might see a person who has four or five different specialists for their different systems, and none of those folks talk to each other. So the, the challenge in systems medicine is not unique to space flight. It's something we see every day in healthcare. Uh, and the more we can take a systems approach and a holistic approach to taking care of people, um, the better we're going to take care of folks on Earth and in space. Good, thank you. Yes, and in a space flight, you cannot take all of those specialists. So space flight, space flight will potentially force the issue and there'll be translational re return back to, back to Earth. Let's hope so. Dr. Antonson. Well, not only can you not take all those specialists, but you might not even be able to get a hold of them for a consultation, depending on the amount of time that you have to wait for messages to go back and forth between the spacecraft and, and Earth. Um, the challenge I think that we have when we look at how do we take the next step is that whatever is starting to come out of the nebulous term of systems medicine is probably gonna become a need or a requirement in order to make something like a Mars mission a reality. I think there's a lot of people who underestimate the risk that's involved in that. And it's not gonna be answered or reduced or mitigated by a business as usual approach to the way we've done medicine or the way we've done space flight. And so how we actually frame that and mature these concepts, flesh them out and put some meat on the bones of these things is really the next challenge within how do we make space flight capable of taking the next step? Because up until this point, those steps that got us from the surface of the earth into low earth orbit and those steps that are going to get us from the surface of the earth back out to the moon, those are still living in the domain where this, the vehicle systems problems are far outweighing the human systems problems. But that next step beyond that, the proportion of risk carried by the human system into that total system is going to be significantly larger. And it's something that I don't think we're going to be able to address without maturing this type of approach and these thoughts into something that is implementable. Excellent. Thank you. So those are the marching orders for the students who are hopefully online. That's what they need to be looking at. Not more of the same, but what appropriate changes need to be made. Couldn't agree more. Dr. Fogarty. Yeah, pleasure to have been a part of the conversation. Um, can't disagree with anything my panelists have said as much as I like to. Um, <laughs> a reflex. <laughs> well, you know, I did groom them for a while, so they turned out okay. I'll say that. Um, you know, it's it, it is true. I mean, both aspects. There's there's application to space flight, and I think it. You know, what we need to achieve in space flight is going to make this a priority approach. Um, we can use that to learn from, but obviously both these gentlemen, as well as all the other physicians I've run into recognize the need for the broader application. So anyone studying any type of medicine of understanding their role in, in the larger system of systems, right? Um, that we move toward that intent and, and policy makers, and maybe, maybe some are tuned in today and, you know, this could resonate with them because this is a valuable uh, approach 
to engage in, but we have to have the will to do it, not different than the one, the charge that was given in the 60s to go to the moon. Like you, and you have to back it up with the resources. It, it, you know, we get a lot where people say you want to get there, but it needs to be a concerted effort um, with appropriate backing to, to fulfill the intent. So, you know, it, for any one of us to be a part of that um, is, is a part of our responsibility. But I do think this base program can give tangible examples and also very inspirational to folks in terms of where they can apply things and, and see impact. Um, so no, it was a delight and I wish we could have taken more questions, obviously. Very interesting insights from the, from the audience. So look forward to the after session if we're gonna have one. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm afraid we have to we'll have to close up shop because of the because of people have other people do have other commitments. It's talking about human spaceflight, but um, but we may have this we may have this same panel back again at some point in the future. So all is not lost, and uh, I would venture to say that we have not exhausted this topic by any means. So if you guys are willing to do it again, let's plan on doing it again sometime. So with that, I will again express my gratitude on behalf of the audience and on behalf of the uh, Hopkins at Home people and the bioastronautics at Hopkins people. Thank you to all of our panelists and uh, thanks to the audience and, and to everyone who supported us at Hopkins. So with that, we'll, uh, I will draw this to a formal conclusion. Thank you. <laughs>